Okay, we're going to approach the derivation or the justification or introduction to Biosovar law the same way we did it for Gauss's law. We're not going to go through the whole derivation, but we're going to proceed in a kind of way that shows how it works. So let's start with a very idealized problem where you have an infinite wire and it carries a current I, and then go to a plane that's perpendicular to the wire and try and map out what the electric what the magnetic field looks like if you go around a circle centered on on the wire you you should re realize that the magnetic field vectors go around in circles this is something we've done before but if you don't remember exactly we'll we'll revise this a little bit and show where it comes from so if you imagine looking from a top view so the wire here is the infinite wire it's coming out of the page the current is coming towards you so the ds vectors that point in the direction of the current are coming out of the page the r hat unit vector that points from the element to the point where you want to find the magnetic field is this way to the word to the point where you want to find the magnetic field so ds cross r hat is pointing this way and you can do the same thing for all the other uh, points are circle and you can conclude that the magnetic field lines go around in circles like this. We did that for an element of current in the plane of the just this element of current in the plane of the circle but if you go to any other element of uh, current even anywhere along the line it'll be the same thing. The mag so the magnetic field lines basically go around in circles. Okay so why don't we calculate this quantity as you go around the circle. Now you, you should ask why this particular quantity and we'll discuss in a while why this particular quantity but let's just do it for the sake of um, exercise. Let's take this integration and evaluate this integration around the circle. So what does this integration involve? You're integrating the magnetic field dotted into elements of length. So what this means is you cut up your, you first you have to choose a kind of contour, kind of path to go on here we're going to choose a circle. We'll show later on how you can generalize this to other shapes, but for now let's just take a perfect circle and the circle is centered on the wire. So you go around the loop and you get the magnetic field at every single position on the circle and you take the dot product of the magnetic field with the element of length. The element of length vectors are these red vectors. So we've chosen in this case to go around the loop in this direction. The, the red vectors are the elements of length. The blue vectors are the magnetic field vectors. Now, I could, you should, of course, draw the magnetic field vectors at every single location, but then the problem, the picture will become too busy. So I just put the magnetic field vectors at certain locations. But of course, the magnetic field exists everywhere around the circle. So you go to each point on this uh, loop and you get B dotted into DS. Then you go to the next one, you get B dotted into DS and so on. So you're basically making a line integral, the same way we did for getting potential uh, difference between two points. In this case, it's a closed loop. So we denote this by the circle on the integration. So let's see what does this integration give us, and then we'll, we'll see where this is leading and why it's important. So this integration, integration of b dot ds, is integration of b ds cosine theta. Now, is the, what is the, is the angle between every element of length ds and the magnetic field, is it the same for every element of length around the loop or not? It is the same, because always the magnetic field is parallel to the ds vectors at every point around the circle. So what's the angle between the two vectors at every point? We said they're parallel, so the angle is zero. So cosine zero is Basically, integration of b dot ds just becomes integration of b ds. Now the second thing, you know that the magnetic field magnitude at this point, or at this point, or at this point, anywhere on the same point on the circle, it should be the same value, have the same magnitude. So I can take the b outside of the integration, and you get the integration of ds. Now what's integration of ds? The integration of ds means I'm adding this element of length plus this one plus this one plus this one plus this one. When you add all these elements of length, what does it give you? It gives you the total circumference. And the circumference of a circle with radius r is 2 pi r. Okay, now what's the magnetic field at any point on this circle? We derived this before in the last uh, 
part on Biot-Savart law for an infinite wire, we showed that the magnetic field due to an infinite wire mu naught i over 2 pi r, where r is the perpendicular distance to the point. So let's substitute the magnetic field with this value. And you can see immediately that we cancel. The 2 pi r cancels with the 2 pi r. And so you can simplify this to be mu naught times i. And the answer is independent of the radius of the loop then that we choose. So if you make a bigger loop or whatever radius the loop is, this integration doesn't depend on the, on the radius of the loop. Why, why did I say that this is, there's an analogy between this and what we did for Gauss's law? It's important to, to understand when I mean by analogy, I don't mean that they're the same thing. In fact, they are completely different things. Here you're integrating over a line, and here in Gauss's law you're integrating over a surface. So they're completely different. But there's some similarity or analogy in the following sense. Remember when we tried to derive Gauss's law for the case of point charges fixed in space. We said first, let's get the electric flux through a sphere centered on the point charge. And we found that when you got integration of E dot dA through that sphere, it turned out to equal to the charge inside over epsilon node, and it was independent of the radius of the sphere. That's where there's some analogy. Here, when you integrated B dot dS around this loop, it turned out to be a value that's independent of the radius. And also, here we had a notion that the, the right-hand side of Gauss's law was the charge enclosed inside the surface divided by epsilon naught. Here we have the same notion. We're going to show that the, we have something called the current enclosed in the loop. So this current is enclosed in the loop because right at this point, the current goes through the area enclosed by the loop. So if the current was going here, then it's out of the loop. If the current is here, it's, in, it's going inside the loop. So we have the same notion of current enclosed. And in this case, the current enclosed at the right-hand side gives you a positive value, the same sense that here you had a positive value for the flux if the charge enclosed was positive. And we can actually uh, have a right-hand rule that determines the sign of the right side in a very easy way. If you put your fingers in the direction of the ds vectors and you choose to, you're choose, you choosing to go around the ds vectors the way it's shown in the picture, the thumb in, in that case will point upwards and it's in the direction of the current. So that means that the magnetic field that will be produced by this current that's in the direction of the thumb will be in the same direction, the magnetic field will be in the same direction as ds so that when you get the dot product between b and ds you get a positive number. So whenever you put your fingers in the direction of ds and the thumb points in the direction of the current, then you know immediately that the right-hand side of this is going to be positive. So you can consider the current enclosed to be positive in this sense. Okay, what if we multiply both sides of this equation by minus 1? So I put the minus here and I put the minus here. Nothing happens when you multiply by minus 1 on both sides. But let's take this minus with the ds. And so we can write this as minus ds. Now minus ds means that every element of length is being multiplied by minus 1. So instead of elements of length being now in the direction of the magnetic, of the magnetic field, when you, when you take minus ds, it'll be a, a vector called ds prime, which is opposite these. These are the ds prime vectors you see that they're opposite, in the opposite direction. So minus ds is basically ds prime, which, is ve which are vectors opposite the direction of ds. Now, if you integrate b dot into this ds prime, you can see that the angle between the ds and magnetic field is 180 degrees now. And that's why you get this minus sign on the right-hand side. You get a minus negative sign because of the cosine 180. If you write down uh, this rule by integrating b dot ds prime and the ds vectors in this case are opposite the direction they were before then on the right hand side we get a minus sign and we can see this how to get this minus sign automatically if you again put your fingers in the direction of ds in this case when you curl your fingers towards ds the thumb will point downwards and when the thumb points downwards it's not pointing in the direction of the magnetic field of the current and so that means that the magnetic field produced by this current is going to be opposite the direction of the ds vectors. And so that's why you get a minus sign. So you can always think about if you get a minus sign by when you put your fingers in the direction of the ds vectors, the thumb 
If it points opposite the current, then you're going to get a minus sign on the right side. So that's kind of analogous uh, to the case of Gauss's law when you have a negative charge inside the Gaussian surface. When you have a negative charge inside the Gaussian surface, integration of E dot dA was the charge enclosed, which is minus Q. It's a negative charge. It's a negative value. And it's independent of the radius. Here we have the same thing. When you integrate B dot dS, now I'm going to remove this prime here. I'm just going to call this dS. This dS is of course not the same dS as we took before. It's just any element of length, but now I'm choosing to go around this way. So if you get integration of B dot dS around this way, it turns out to be negative. Why? Because when you get dS going around this way, the direction of the magnetic field is opposite the direction of the dS vectors, and you get a minus sign. Okay, so to summarize what we did, if you take if you choose to go around uh, and integrate b dot ds where ds is in the same direction as the magnetic field, then you get mu naught times i. If you choose to go around integration of b dot ds with the ds vectors opposite the magnetic field vectors, then you get the same thing but with a minus sign. That's where this sign convention is useful to use to predict this, the, the sign of the right-hand side automatically. Again, you put your fingers in the direction of ds. If the thumb points in the direction of the current, then you have a positive. If the thumb points opposite the direction of the current, you get a negative. That's just a simple way to remember the sign of the right-hand side for this kind of integral. In the next video, we're going to see what happens if you take the shape of this loop to be not a circle and see what happens in that case.